Mm, welcome back to the Immigration Answers Show. My name is James Oliver Hacking the Third. I am an immigration lawyer. I've been practicing law since 1997. I'm an old, old man. I've been practicing at the hacking law practice now, hacking immigration law since 2007. I'm an immigration lawyer. That's all that we do since 2012. I love being an immigration lawyer. It's lots of fun. I get to help a lot of people. I just got done writing a 3,000 word uh, blog post on lawsuits. On lawsuits, it's everything I think about lawsuits. I'm as transparent as can be. If the government wants to come read my thoughts on lawsuits, they are certainly free to do that. I hope you all are doing well. I thank you all for joining us today. And I'm mostly appreciative of my good friend, Daniel Axelbaum, being with me. I like the show so much better when Daniel's here with me. Daniel, how are you? I'm great, Jim. I'm just, you know, your whole setup is so, so great, professional. I'm just feel, feeling like I need to step it up here. <laughs> somebody said, somebody said in the comments uh, in yet from yesterday's show, they said, this is starting to feel like a real show. And that's, <laughs> that's sort of what we wanted. So once was we, it before, I mean, yeah, on. before it was rinky dink as can be, but <laughs> once we, once we move into the new building, wherever that may be, um, we're going to trick that studio out really well where I'm going to actually be able to talk on camera, but also have the monitor behind me. So it'll be sort of like almost oh, like wow. a television studio, I think is what we're going to do. And, and that'll be a lot of fun. I think the more professional we make it, the better. I think that the production values have really increased. Thanks in large part to our marketing team, especially Justin Maldonado, who's our video guy he's doing such a great job and you know i used to just like show up on a saturday morning probably unshaved wearing a t-shirt and the camera would be sort of off angle the lighting would be all wrong my face would be like either bleached or pink and my you know the the head would look all big and weird and he's like no no, no we can't do that anymore well it was the message that counts jim and people loved love the message you're putting out I think that's true. I think that's true. And in fact, I was watching an old video today, an old success story from 2018. And even back then I was still sort of bomb, 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 bomb. So we've, we've stepped it up. We've, we've improved our game. We think uh, it's paid off and we're certainly glad to do it. We, we love doing the immigration answer show. I like having you here with me, Daniel, and we're going to have some of the lawyers from the firm start joining us on Thursday. So pretty soon Daniel's going to be joining me on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And I like this four o'clock slot. I think we get a lot of interest and a lot of viewership and a lot of people that want to come on. So how have you been doing? How was your day? Oh, great, Jim. You know, we've just been having a lot of great meetings and I enjoy uh, seeing everyone. Um, I was just thinking, because now you're having all these guest co-hosts, co so we have to like have a, a voting, like America's Got Talent. The, <laughs> who's going to be Jim's co-host? We'll have everyone vote. <laughs> well, I don't think anyone will knock you off your pedestal because you're- I don't know. You're, you're a natural and you and you do a good job and and people really like to talk to you. Well, thanks, Jim. I enjoyed it. How are you doing? What's on your mind today? Well, um, you know, two weeks ago I was wearing my Cardinal hat because I was going to the Cardinal game, but everybody felt sick at home. So we didn't ended up not going. But I am going tonight to see the Toronto Blue Jays take on our hometown Cardinals. I've seen the Blue Jays twice in my life, once at Fenway Park in Boston, and the Blue Jays won twenty to two. And then a couple of years ago, I was in Toronto and I saw the Blue Jays play and they scored 20 runs that time. So the two times I've seen them, they've scored 20 runs each time. So I'm certainly hopeful they don't score 20 runs tonight, mostly because I don't want to stay up that late. <laughs> well, that'll be fun. I like their uniforms, the Blue Jays. They got some cool I, I always liked the Blue Jays. When I was a kid, I really liked the Montreal Expos. I do like their uniforms. They've got a lot of fun players. They have Vlad Jr., and a couple other players uh, that are really fun, um, Bo Bichette, and they're just they're just a fun little team. And you know, I, I always like rooting for the smaller market teams. I'm, I'm always mostly going to be for the little guy. My son Yusuf is a big Yankees fan, so it's fun whenever the Yankees aren't doing well. But of course, this year they have the best record in baseball, so we'll see. All right. Well, one more question, then I'll we'll bring up our first guest. But do you imagine yourself in the catcher's position now when you watch the <laughs> Cardinals play? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, in fact, uh, I was so Nor has pitching practice on Sundays or Mondays, and it's out in St. Charles. And I, luckily, I get to sit on a bucket because I have to catch her. And uh, she's getting to the point now where I almost can't keep up i need to probably get a catcher's mitt because like every fifth or sixth pitch really hurts my hand but <laughs> if, I, if i had to squat down 
I would not be able to walk today. I, I don't know how Yachty has done it all these years. I don't know how. It, it's yeah. just such a – I mean, he must be in just such great physical shape, and his core must just be so strong to think not only are you squatting down there for three hours straight, but you're also – making those throws to the pitcher's mound and to second over and over and over. Like, and I, and you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm only throwing 40 feet. He's throwing 66 feet. So it's, it's something. Well, that's, that's great. Jim gives you a whole new res- respect for, <laughs> for that position. For sure, sure. For sure. All right. Well, um, we're happy everyone's here and we've got our waiting room filling up. So we'll bring up our first guest, uh, Mr. Mohammed. Welcome, sir. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm Mohammed. How are you? Yeah, uh, very good, very good. Thank you for guys for putting all this time uh, online on YouTube. Uh, uh, quick, I called you, Jim, um, uh, a month ago. I told you I was going to have my interview for the DV program uh, on May 19th. So I went with my spouse, kids, uh, all documents are there. And uh, boom, uh, I got something in my face called 5535. Mm. Then I started listening to your um uh, videos uh, on on YouTube, and then I I got to understand what a five five three five. I, I never heard of it before. I'm Syrian originally. I'm from Syria. I, I think that's the reason uh, behind it. They send me an email uh, a few hours after I uh, finish my interview, and they tell me I ha- I uh, this is the form. Fill it up and send it back with the three days max. And of course, it includes the toughest question: fifteen years travel history, and I am quite a bit of a traveler business uh, requirements i have my passport stamps uh, uh, overlapping each other i can't even read them uh, uh, back to two, uh, 2007 so i do this excel sheet and i try to put everything that i find uh, as transparent I, I i listen to your advice in your recorded video that uh, fill it and fill it uh, uh, thoroughly and truthfully so i i try to do my best in finding the answer so uh one uh, they didn't mention if uh, shall I uh, send an email per family member or one email including all forms. What I did is send one email including all forms, uh, not one email per uh, member. So I don't know if this was right or wrong. Second, do I need uh, your services as a, uh, as a lawyer to uh, probably... Uh, I heard you saying that some legal intervention can probably work when this takes long. So a couple things. Number one, as far as the emails, I think it's fine that you sent them all in one email. I might wait a few days and then resend them all one at a time. Just say I wasn't sure which way you wanted it, just to sort of be a pest and to remind them. Which embassy was this, Mohammed? Kuwait. Kuwait. Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look up this lawyer. His name is Curtis Morrison. Curtis Morrison. He does lawsuits like I do, Mm -hmm. but Curtis is really specialized in lawsuits, and he's been fighting for two or three years to try to get the government to issue these diversity visas that they aren't issuing. And of course, you know, I I would assume that you know that if you don't get your immigrant visa by September 30th, it is as if you were never picked in the lottery, right? So you're basically starting all over. So Curtis um, is literally fighting the government. And for some reason, Joe Biden continues, his team continues to fight these cases but you know, if they don't use those visas, they basically go in the trash. And for the last under Trump, and now even under Biden, the diversity visa cases are sort of at the bottom of the list of priorities at the embassy. When in fact, they should be at the top of the list because you have that hard deadline. So I think that you really need to reach out to Curtis, and you could tell him that you came on the show. Curtis knows me, and we talk, and he's a really good guy. I'd follow him on Twitter because lawsuits over the diversity visa have become their own little specialty. Like they're doing class actions. Like they're suing for everybody that they can sign up into one lawsuit. I do my lawsuits one at a time um, because I just find that to be more effective. But he's been representing like many thousands of people each year in the diversity visa for the last three years. So I really think you'd be well suited to reach out to Curtis. And just what I would do is I'd follow Curtis for like three or four days. He puts out a lot of content, a lot of, especially on Twitter about what's going on with his different cases. And then you can find out about each case, look up that case and then see, I'm sure he probably has one going right now for people in your shoes, which are from last October until September at the end of the end of September this year. Okay, so uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll follow him, but 
the status that is shown on the system when I get online to check the status, it shows refused. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, so your your visa was refused. They didn't issue you you issue you the visa at the time. So refused. So some people call visas denials, but they're not actually denied. They're just refused. So that just means you're in administrative processing. Your case is still pending. They've asked you for more stuff. As you know, you gave it to them, and now it's just pending. So until they until they start working on it again and either approve it or refuse it again, that that status isn't going to change. Is it processed? Is this 5535 processed locally in Kuwait Consulate or yeah. is it somewhere else? Yes, in Kuwait. Uh, so in Kuwait Consulate, they they go, uh, they go review the 5535 forms that I sent. Yeah. Uh, it's not sent like to DC or somewhere else. I mean, maybe for Syrians just because they're racist, but uh, generally no. Okay, because during the interview and even when she said there are some other forms that you need to apply, she was talking in, in, I don't know, was she misleading me or she was just genuinely positive saying, this will take a few weeks, you need to fill this. And she asked me for one more uh, piece of information, which is my military record. So I dropped it off as she requested. And I put even a proof of me sending the emails because she gave me a paper saying drop off at window two, military record translated. Uh, and she put also the note of the 5535 form that I need a form per family member. So what I did, I printed the uh, one copy, one page of the email showing that it's been sent. And I put the military records, attached them with the cover letter she gave me saying, drop this to the window. Um, but she was like saying, uh, you need to bring this document and we'll call you when to bring the passport. I don't know if, uh, if uh, there is any luck in there. If I had a dollar for every time an officer, whether at the consulate or at a USCIS office here in America, told my clients or people that I talked to something nice that didn't sound mean or harsh or or like a delay or the start of a delay where they just act, oh, it's no big deal. Two or three weeks, it'll all work out. That's just them being nice and not wanting to say to your face that they're going to sit on the case. I, I don't believe anything that they say. And I probably need to do a special video just on this about maybe I could call it like the lies that officers tell at the end of interviews. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. Good luck, Mohammed. Keep us posted. Okay, brother. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would. All right, Jim. Thanks for for that. Sure, Your buddy. Your voice is so calm and like it's like it's like well, it's interesting, but it's like you're saying all this really like hard to you know. You can't tell that. Daniel, but I'm not looking at you. I'm not looking at. I'm looking at the camera. So okay. we're using a new camera. So you're actually over here to my right, so I can see you now. But so it's actually forcing me. Especially, I'm really glad you're here because you can pull the people up and down. But it's really forcing me to listen. And, and I think, I think my answers are getting better. I will see, but it was very precise. Yeah. yeah. People might be not so happy if you don't get too fired up, but well, well I got a, I got a little fired up yesterday. Um, and then of course, for everybody who's watching, remember this is on YouTube. The person who called last yesterday asked us to take it down. I don't know why anyone is surprised, but this mm -hmm. is on the internet. The whole world can see it. So if you're, if you're worried about saying something, don't come on or use an alias and stay off camera. All right. Well, our next guest has a very good disguise and um, we'll be bringing him up. He's got some cool shades. Donnie nice. Yorjan, hello. Oh. Welcome. Hey, how are you? Good. How are Great. you doing? Yeah, good, good. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Mr. Jim Hiking. Not me. Okay, that's cool. Um, <laughs> go ahead. I mean, bo both of you. No, sorry. it's Israel. Go it's ahead. All good. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, well, um, uh, I came three, three, three and a half years ago, United States and uh, uh, B, B, B1, B2 visa. Uh, I'm a craftsman. Uh, I do ECAT material. So when I came, uh, basically second time, I, uh, I, uh, I wanted to stay and I, I filed EB1 case. So, uh, you, filed, you, you, you filed an EB-1 case while you're in the United States on a B-1, B-2? Yes. And how long after you arrived in the United States did you file your EB-1 case? Um, and uh, I needed to wait three months. After three months, uh, I, I, I submit my application. Okay. Uh, who told, who told you this was a good idea? 
uh, my solicitor. Your solicitor is that an American attorney, or or what? What do you mean your solicitor? Is that, is that an immigration attorney in the United States, or was it somebody else? Yes, yes, she is. Yeah. Okay. My my uh, yeah. My my question is not uh, not uh, it's not about this. My question is uh, uh, about GB lottery. So this year, my wife she won the GB lottery. Uh, we have uh, two kids. Uh, she's back to my country, uh, but I have legal status here till that. Uh, uh, I've been I've been visited three times all, over the past three years. To, uh, back to my country. Last time I've been three months ago. You're traveling. Uh, so, you're traveling. You're traveling on advanced parole off the EB green card. Yeah, EB. While while yeah, my case my case is still on pending uh, for I one four eighty five. Has the I one forty been approved? Yes. Okay. And, All right. So, what's the question? Um, my question is, is um, well, uh, my right right now my advanced parole, uh, I mean, travel document is finished, but I filed uh, eight months ago to renew it, but still waiting. And when I check on the USCIS website, it says uh, at least fifteen to sixteen months. The they're sending now advanced parole. So, uh, our DV lottery case is is uh, very low. It's two thousand five, uh, two thousand seven hundred something. They're saying the interview will be in October or November. So my question is, uh, if I can go to back to my country, my wife and my kids can go to interview to back to my country, and I can stay here show my paperwork or do i have to visit to my country but uh, i'm not sure i'm gonna receive my i mean travel document until until then if you leave without your travel document it's as if you abandon your green card so i wouldn't advise doing that are you going to try to adjust here based on your wife being selected in the diversity visa or what's or are you just going to stick with your green yeah. card application yeah i want to yeah i want to adjust with my wife i mean you want to you want to adjust through the diversity visa under her application. Yes. What does your she, what does your what does your brilliant solicitor say about this? Because I think your brilliant solicitor puts you in puts you in harm's way by filing an EB EB an employment based green card application while, while on a B one B two. I would never have done that. So what is what does the brilliant solicitor say about that? Uh, he said. Uh, uh, the, they can file back to my country, but uh, they just put my. Uh, they say I'm I'm in United States, and when when she, when they approve, when they come here, so I can join. Uh, yeah, that's possible, but I mean I can't tell you that based on this phone call. I'd have to look at all the paperwork. I'd have to see all the timelines. I'm not comfortable telling you that any of this is going to work. I'm worried they're going to punish you for having filed an employment-based green card application while in the United States on a B1 B2 visa. That's not what a B1, B2 visa is for. That's not supposed to happen. And I wouldn't have filed that case. So I think you might be in a little bit of trouble. Oh my. Oh, okay. So what's your best advice? I mean, my wife and the kids can go to interview and then uh, I, I can be here or do you want me to go back and... No, I don't, I don't want you to go back. I think you're putting yourself in harm's way. But I can't tell you based on with this phone call other than to tell you that this is very serious. And I think you might be in trouble for having done what you did. And I, I don't think USCIS is going to like it. I also, you also can't ignore the fact that, just as I told the last caller, the State Department isn't really processing diversity visa applications. So I don't think anyone can say with any certainty that because your wife's visa number for the diversity visa is 2700 which as you say is in fact a low number i don't know if that translates to her actually getting an immigrant visa to come to the united states just because the biden team is sitting on these and they're they're just not processing them uh, okay so so can, can i contact after can i contact you uh, after the live show and well if you if you contact us no, not really, because the only reason you would contact us is if you want us to take over both cases. You already have a solicitor. If you want to stick with them, there's no reason to call my office. Um, you know, the purpose of calling our office is to see if someone wants to hire us. 
we do not we are not capable of keeping up with all the phone calls that we get so the only people that get to talk to a lawyer are the ones who are actually serious about hiring us okay uh, uh okay thank right. you very much thank you very much uh, okay thank you Good yeah. thank you thank you for your help thank you very much really... all right thanks jim for answering that one sure buddy all right we've got tootie next hello tootie welcome to the show Hi, how are you? Hi, great. Judy. How you doing? I'm doing good, Jim. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So, you know, we've discussed my case before. Oh, sweetheart. I don't remember the people I uh, talked to yesterday. Well, my husband's from Pakistan. Okay. And he just had his visa interview in February and he was approved. Nice. Yeah. Well, he's in administrative processing since February. And then he wasn't approved. No, he got the form, the paperwork and everything that says approved. Thank you. They gave him. And I don't know what to do. They gave him the paperwork that said you met all the obligations. Blah, blah, and then they immediately stuck him in administrative process. They never gave us any reason why. We don't have an email from them saying they need more documentation. We have nothing. That's well, how they do. That's yeah. the thing. So I made a video about this and I 100% believe it. I say it on the show all the time. Daniel can probably quote it to you chapter and verse until you have the visa in hand, anything that they tell you about something being approved. I mean, there's, there's no such thing as an embassy being able to a approve it and b put it in administrative processing by definition. If it's not approved, if it's approved, it can't be an administrative processing. And I said his visa is ready, but his, Case on CX says ready for interview. He had his interview in February. Yep. So what's the question, Tootie? Because this this all sounds like them. There's nothing surprising here. What what can I help with? How long do I have to wait before I can file a mandamus? That question determine depends on when the case was approved at USCIS and sent to the National Visa Center. That's what that question. We've been waiting for four years. Right, but when did when did when did the State Department get the case? It's four years at the national at the State Department, or four years since you filed the I one thirty. Four years at the State Department. Yeah, you've waited long enough. Yeah, it's time to sue. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, we're at that point. We were told to take between um, sixty and one hundred and eighty days. So we're trying to wait out the eighty the next eighty days. Oh sure, no rush. Whenever you're ready, just call and tell Daniel and say I'm I'm done waiting. It's, I mean, four years is ridiculous. Yeah, four years. We actually filed the first time in um, January 2017. What does that mean? The first, oh, with USCIS. USCIS, five years. But you've and only had one application from start to finish. It's the same old. It's the same old one. One application, same one. Got it. Okay. So, all right. I appreciate it, Jim. Thanks, Tootie. Have a good night. You too. Bye. Bye. All right. Isn't that funny when people say mm, bye? I don't know why. Why do people do, <laughs> mm, bye. People do that? No, I, I, th I know a lot of people that do that. Mm, bye. <laughs> I just my, remember my grandpa used to just hang up the phone. <laughs> it's like you're still talking. <laughs> like, yeah. Hi, yeah. <laughs> That's my dad. My dad liked to hang really? up. Really? Yeah. It's funny. I was with my, you know, my dad, you know, Daniel, my dad passed away in December and we, my sister and I went out to dinner on Friday. We were going to go to the Indigo Girls. We did, and we went out to dinner. We went to Salt and Smoke, which is really good. Have you been there? Yeah, yeah, it yeah, is really good. I great. really like it. So we had dinner and then we drove down to Indigo Girls and I was like, Molly, there isn't, the, the parking lot's pretty empty. Well, they canceled the show because somebody got COVID. So the show was canceled, but on the way down there, we were listening to old voicemails from my dad and <laughs> there was one where he goes, uh, and it, there's always the quick hang up, but there's one where he goes, daddy, this is Jim, call me. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of saying, Jimmy, this is dad, which is what he usually said. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Also, funny. it sounds super urgent. Like, you don't know yeah. if it's like, <laughs> that's funny. I mean, when, when I lived in the dorms in college, I would play, back then we, I had an actual, you know, an actual answering machine and I would play the messages for my, for my friends. And like, if I borrowed a hundred dollars from my dad, he was like worse than a loan shark. He would call every day, <laughs> Jimmy, you got that money you owe me? Where's that money you owe me? Jimmy, <laughs> give me that money. Your yeah. roommates think you're in like serious debt trouble. A hundred dollars. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. Well, uh, Taleb's waiting here. Hello, sir. Hi. Hi, Jim. Hi, Taleb. How you doing? Oh, yes. I remember Taleb now. Oh, we're gonna, did you have the interview or that's coming up? Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so how did it go? Us. Let's hear it. Yeah. He just approved it after like 45 minutes. He said, he said, like, I'm going to approve your, like your marriage. And then we just left happy. So you got the green wow. card. The, they yeah. approved the whole. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Was I harder on you than the officer was or was the officer? No, harder? no. Here it was like really crazy. There he was just so <laughs> easy. I know he didn't be even put us in one room. Like, like a regular room, then just normal talking, and then suddenly he said, I approved it. Then, which field office was this? It says, as you said, Santa Ana, and Santa Ana. and yeah. the whole thing, the whole thing was 25 minutes, and you and your wife were in the room. Just together. the waiting thing was really long. Then he just said, like, he'd be call us, then he just had a seat, then we swear a little bit, and then even he didn't see our picture. My wife, she was mad. It was like, I was preparing this until morning, we didn't sleep actually, just two hours because she was put in the picture and we like one envelope like really big book then she was like just she like she was to want to tell me let him at least see it i was like no you want to yeah leave i've it. had so, i've had people try to continue to convince the officer even after they've said the case was approved that's always a bad idea so don't do that no and, and also um i'm glad that it all worked out i'm glad that they were kind and the one thing i think people sometimes freak out when they're waiting in the waiting room for a really long time but a lot of times that means the officer is going over the application before they bring you in and if they're satisfied by what you've already submitted then sometimes that makes the interview go even faster so sitting in the waiting room might not be a bad thing and this would be so good it was crowded yeah it was really crowded this would be so a good that's... TikTok. i'll do this on TikTok tonight Sorry. Awesome. Yeah. Well, good, Talib. We're happy for you, bud. Did you do you actually have the green card? Did you get it? Not yet. They said I think he's gonna send. They're gonna send after like two weeks in the mail or maybe one week. I'm not sure. Well, thanks for coming back yeah. on and letting us know. Thank yeah. You. Did so you feel I just a little more comfortable? That, don't be worried. It's like <laughs> something really easy. I didn't thought when I done when I'm done. I was like that time when I'm done. I saw your notification that like Jim is doing. I was gonna call like enter, but it's already done. So I said, let me go and have a rest. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming uh, back. Awesome. Good Thank luck, you so Talib. Much. See you, buddy. See you. Have a nice day. That's great to hear, Jim. Yeah, I was worried about old Talib. Yeah, yeah. All right. Mr. Jaman, welcome to the show. Assalamu alaikum. Well, How are you, Mr. Daniel? How are you, sir? Good, great. How can we help you today? Thank you. Yeah, I did uh, the Daniel Hawa renewal my green card apply in February. Yeah, I did renew my green card apply in February. You know? And uh, it still is, uh, I don't hear from them, nothing. You know, Micah project they did for me and I talked to them, but it still is, no, nothing. Just last February to 2021, February 26, I have like. Oh, so. And they took year, my feedback in September 26, last year. So w what was your status at the time that you applied for the green card? I expired my 10 years green card. What'd you say? 10 years green card, my permanent resident card or expired in 10 years. So now I'm renewing again. Oh, so, okay. So you're asking me is, so you, you filed an I-90 to renew your green card and it's been pending for 15 months. Almost 15 months, yes. Yeah, that's okay. I wouldn't be too worried. I would say between 18 and 24 months is probably about how long it's going to take. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Now I was on a chat board with other immigration lawyers on Facebook today in a, in a Facebook lawyers group. And somebody said, I have I nineties that have been pending for two years. And then I just had someone get approved in nine days. So I think they're working on the newer cases and then they're working their way backward to yours, which is how they do things sometimes. So, I mean, an I 90 is about the easiest thing to get approved. Um, I've seen I've seen them approve all kinds of cases where people actually had criminal problems in between and it still got approved. So I think you're fine. You're just waiting. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Have a nice day. Good luck. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. So MD Daniel, he's he's working with the Micah Project. I don't know if you know them, but our yeah. friends over there, um, Jessica, and Nicole, they're doing a fundraiser for the Micah Project, which is a great organization. It's going to be a trivia night uh, on October 1st. And so hopefully we're going to, our firm's going to sponsor it and get a table or two for that. So that would be, I don't know if you ever go to trivia nights, but I like those and they're a lot of fun. Well, I, I would love to. Yeah, that'd awesome. be great. Cool. 
All right. Blessed. Welcome. Hi. How are you guys? Hi, how are you? Hi, Blessed. Good okay. afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, here's my question. My boyfriend um, has just been, I'm not called to call it uh, deported. Um, he was, I guess, expulsed or he crossed the border. Um, we're from Haiti, but he, uh, from um, Mexico, he crossed the border, hoping he was going to just get an asylum and to come here and be with family. But that didn't happen. He got just deported either last Thursday or Friday. Yep. So um, I need to know how we can go because my our original plan was to get a, um, a fiance visa for him to come here so we can get married because my parents are old. They can't travel. So we wanted to do it here instead of, you know, abroad. So now he's back home in Haiti and um, I don't want to go visit him there. So he his plan is to go either back to Mexico or Brazil so we can actually visit because i don't want to go back to haiti because there's a lot of kidnapping a lot of dangerous stuff happening so what is our best course to go forward so we can make this process happen so he said i asked him if they they gave him any uh paperwork when he got uh when he they took him back he said there was no paperwork given he was processed you know with the fingerprint and a picture was taken so he's got a a a, a case I, I don't know like they have his name on a record but he but there was no he didn't see any judge so what is your take on that case? Who came up with this plan to have him sneak into the United States? That was really dumb. He, that, he didn't want to wait for he didn't want to wait for the the he was worried I you know he was worried about me and he didn't want to wait for the long process. So he thought well, not, he, he, can, he, he just, just walked into the thing thinking hey you know it's not a crime. <laughs> but obviously now we're finding out hey that is you know not good cuz now they you know it's illegal but he thought hey I'm walking in I'm not you know Maybe they'll just say, hey, okay, come and we'll... Anyway, so that's where we're at right now. So did he he cross the border and then customs caught him and then they processed him and they gave him expedited removal? Right. Okay. Like, do you know where exactly he was caught or detained? Uh, somewhere in Texas, he said. Is this the first time that he entered the United States? First time, right. Yeah, so I don't know. The, this thinking is all wrong on this because he actually just made his case a thousand times more complicated just because he wouldn't wait like a regular person. So this is like the dumbest thing he could have done was try to sneak into the United States. I would have to look at his paperwork, but he might have a deportation order, which means he might not be able to come back for 10 years. So this whole plan was really backwards. So you're saying 10, 10 whole years? Like it could be. I mean, we'd have to track down his immigration file, see what happened. Um, he got expedited removal, and then we'd have to see if that constitutes a deportation order such that he, he might have taken voluntary departure. I don't know what he signed. and He didn't sign anything, he said. Nothing was um, – he didn't sign anything. I, I, I severely doubt that, Blessed. That doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't make any sense that he wouldn't have any paperwork. He said he didn't. He didn't have anything. Nothing. He no one talked to him. That, that he's you know, not being, no he's, he didn't. He didn't, so, he didn't give so anything. He just, to go. So he just magically appeared in Haiti. Like one minute he's in Texas, one minute he's in Haiti. That does that sound credible to you? No, but there were so many people that he. They didn't really process them. He said like there are some people they talk to. They uh, asked some questions, but he didn't get to ask any questions. When he first came through, he said they did uh, take picture and fingerprint. And then you know, they waited uh, for about two two weeks, not not two weeks, like twelve days, about. And then they put them back in a plane, and then to Haiti. He didn't have any paperwork. Um, that's what he said. So there's no paperwork given to him, and no, no, he didn't sign anything at all. I don't believe him. Uh. Does it sound credible to you that he would be deported from the United States and we'd have no paperwork related to that deportation and that he didn't talk to anybody? I'm sure he didn't see a judge. I'm sure that part's true, but yeah, he, would, he, he would have been, he, he would have been assigned a case number. He would have a case. There would be records that we could get, but the idea that he was kicked out of the country with no copy of any paperwork, I've never well, heard. They had tried to look out for him. They, they couldn't find anything on him when they, you know, he didn't surface when they were looking for him. His family could not find him anywhere. They called, they put his name into um detainee locator. They couldn't find anything. 
Yeah. Well, he was in there somewhere. He, maybe they put him under a different name. I mean, the detainee locator is notoriously inaccurate. It doesn't it doesn't say people's right names because you spell one little letter wrong in their name and the thing doesn't it comes back no match. Okay. So what is what is our next step? How do we move forward from well, one you have to track down his records and two if you want to if you want to sponsor him, you'd have to get married and get that process started. That's sort of the easy part. Then there's the whether or not he's subject to a 10-year bar or if not, you know, he's going you're going to have to show some kind of extreme hardship to bring him back because he broke the law and snuck into the United States. So he has um, lots of problems with coming back. I, what, do I think an embassy is going to want to give him uh, an immigrant visa, even if your I-130 is approved? I think they're going to be pissed that he snuck into the United States and tried to um, tried to jump the line. And then if you're telling me that he made some kind of an asylum claim saying it wasn't safe for him to go back to Haiti, if that he, was, didn't, he didn't talk any, to anybody. They, they didn't interview. There was no talking. He said there was no time. Listen, that, that's not true. Everybody gets to talk to an officer. Everyone gets to make a credible fear uh, statement or not. So I, I, this, this sounds to me like he's not being entirely truthful. Um, okay. I, I don't know why he would lie, but he, I don't, I don't, he's not, no, I don't think, I don't know. I really am not sure. So how do we move forward from, from this blunder that he obviously, um, well, did again, he was first, patient. You, first you have to see what happened to his immigration case. You have to track down his file. You can do, mm -hmm. they can search it by fingerprints if he gets fingerprinted. Then once he gets that, then you could get married. But you have to understand that you're on a long road, even if he doesn't have a 10-year bar, you're going to have to show that him being excluded from the United States, not being allowed back in, is going to produce a hardship on you that's more than the hardship that's um, subject to anybody who's deported, anybody who's not let into the United States. So you have to show there's something about you as the U.S. citizen spouse that you know, you have health issues, money issues, mental issues, psychological issues, those kinds of things that are different than and harder than regular people. They understand that that people who are separated from their spouse experience hardship. This has to be extreme hardship. So it has to be something special. So what I'm telling you is at the end of the day, even if he doesn't have a 10 year bar, which he might have, that even if you put together a really strong case and even if he's your husband, doesn't mean they're going to give him a visa at the end of the day to come to the United States because of what he did. Okay, the ten year if if there is a ten year bar per se, yeah, that we cannot jump that at all. There's no way to fight this. You would know you you that's where the hardship comes in. You'd have to show the hardship for he has two problems. One is he entered without inspection, and he he um, got deported. So either of those might have triggered the ten year bar, and then. If he um, if he lied or made some kind of fraudulent statement, like a, a fake asylum case, then no, he, he has not. He has not. No, he did not at all. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, you'll see. You you got to get the records and see what he said. I, I I can't imagine that someone would go through all the trouble of entering the United States without inspection, coming across law enforcement, and then saying. Oh, you caught me. Send me back to Haiti. What's much more likely is that he said something along the lines of, if I go back to Haiti, somebody's going to hurt me and I'm going to be tortured or something bad's going to happen to me. And then the officer is going to see, say whether or not that's believable. And if it, if it was a stretch, if it wasn't true, that makes things a whole lot more complicated. Okay. Okay. Yeah, if you want to have him call me, I'd be happy to talk to him about it. But I mean, I just don't, I just find it, I can't imagine that someone would go through all that trouble and all that expense and all that heartache and then just be silent and say, oh, you got me, send me back to Haiti. That doesn't seem sensible to me. No, I don't think they gave them a choice. Like there was no processing where they was interviewed and given them a choice to even state a case. There was yeah. no such thing. If that's true, then he, then he might have had some kind of a due process violation, but I bet you ten dollars that there's something in the in his paperwork that says something along the lines of "I fear going back to Haiti." I'd be really surprised if that wasn't the case. Okay. 
Okay. Sorry, so, Blessed. Good luck. That's okay. And how do I get in contact with you to f talk further with the case about the case? Well, you can call the office 314-961-8200. They'll drop all the contact information in the in the thing. But I think I think you have to have a real heart to heart and nail down with him whether or not he said anything. That just doesn't make sense to me. And then and then okay. he has to get fingerprinted and you gotta try to track him down. There, there's some record of him having been in the United States. Right. Okay. Thank you, Blessed. Right. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. All right. That was a tough one, Jim. Well, I mean, people want to jump the line and they think that, that the line as it currently exists is problematic, but then they don't realize that they're making their, they're getting a different line that's much, much longer and much harder. Well, hopefully she was hearing you. Um, our next guest. I, I, I didn't think she was. I don't, I don't, yeah, think, she I don't was, think so but, either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Shay, welcome to the show. Hey. Thanks for waiting. Nobody's good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks good for afternoon. Waiting. Hey, how can we help you? Hey. So I, I believe I'm joining this for the first time, but um, awesome. just to give you a little bit of background, I'm on an F1 visa, STEM OPT. Um, the next year will be my last chance as my F1 visa will expire. Uh, my employer did file for my H1B this year. I was not selected in the lottery. At the same time, I have I am a derivative of my parents on the petition on the green card petition through the F4 category, which is a family based for siblings. Uh, my aunt is a U.S. citizen. The uh, petition was filed back in 2005, uh, June 5th, and our DQ, like our documents, were qualified back on April 4th of 2020. We have already paid the fees. Um, everything is qualified. Police clearance was done. And since then, we have just been waiting for the interview. Uh, from last year in June, we started receiving an automatic email from the NBC, which is the National Visa Center, saying the same thing, that your documents are qualified. Everything is done since April 4th of 2020. But we are waiting to schedule an interview for you because of the COVID backlog. So my pretty much my question is, like, is it the end of the road for me next year once I'm not selected in the H-1B? Because... I just don't know when the interview will happen. Although I am protected under the CSPA, which is the Child Status Protection Act, is that even if I go beyond the age of 21, which I am, I would still be eligible to receive a green card uh, on behalf of my parents' petition. So how how old are you actually? Right now I'm 26. And how long was your case pending at USC? Have you done the math on CSPA? I have. I think it was uh, it was approved back in 2012. Uh, I think that's how it works. That's how my father yeah. explained me. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, and and you haven't filed for a green card. Well, I haven't. But my parents have this petition uh, of the green card in which I'm a derivative. Yeah. So I I don't know. So so this is a great question. Thank you for coming on the show. Um, I think. If the visa category is current and yes. you're and you're here in the United States, I'd have to research it to be sure. But I believe that in theory, you by yourself could apply for a green card to adjust status here in the United States. Your parents are applying for an immigrant visa to come to the United States. Yes. But since you're already here, the question is, can a derivative file for their standalone green card if the parents haven't received their immigrant visa yet or not that's the question yes that is like and it's a great question um what embassy mumbai embassy in india um and when did when did when did you say that their case got dq'd last year like in the no, spring no, april 4th of 2020 that's the exact date they have on file april 4th of 2020 yes so the National Visa Center and Mumbai have had the case for more than two years. Yes. NBC has our case. They have to schedule an interview for us in the Mumbai embassy. Yeah. And every 60 days we get like an automatic email that we are, yeah. they are still waiting. Yeah. And do you know do you know when their visa number actually became current? Yes. So last year in July, I think our final action date was current because okay. the final action date right now is September of 2005 and we are June of 2005. So. 
Well, I think what I would probably recommend is file a lawsuit for mom and dad, try to get their case moving, and then we could also research whether you have to wait for them to come and try to adjust by right. filing a green card. I mean, the good thing is you have another year of OPT, right? So we do yes. have some some little flexibility, but I think what would be ideal is get mom and dad to get the immigrant visa set up. See maybe if you can go over and get an immigrant visa, but I don't want I don't want to do that cuz I don't want you to leave if I can adjust you here. I'd rather adjust you here. Um, and that would, like I said, would take a little bit of research, but it would be a fun yeah. thing. It'd be a fun thing to research. So maybe we can have one of the other attorneys in the office research that and come and tell us on the show, Daniel. If yeah, that, yeah. I mean, I can follow up with you and just yeah. to be transparent, my yeah. parents did hired a lawyer in India yeah. and they tried to expedite their case and they expedited like it was their expedition request was denied saying that the child qualifies for the CSPA. Oh, that's so good. Will, so you have it in writing. Yes. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but a lawsuit's better than an expedite request. And they've oh, been yeah, waiting. I wasn't sure about how yeah, they've been, no, you're fine. They've been waiting two years. So that's uh, this. And, and yeah, yeah, this is, in, it's an interesting case. Are you the only kid on the case? Yes. My elder brother got married. He's not interested to come here. He's in India. He's happy. So he's not yeah. there. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, reach out to Daniel, um, send us an okay. email and then we can go from there. Sure, I can certainly do that. Um, is your email in the link or the chat here? I've been yeah, the team will put it in the comments. Um, it's info at hackinglawpractice.com or info at sure. hackingimmigrationlaw.com. Okay, sounds good. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, thank you, Shay. Shay. All right, take care, guys. See you, bud. That's an interesting case. Yeah. Dan, you know who would like that case is uh, Andrew. <laughs> he's 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 so into immigration it's really fun to ask him questions about this yep. stuff <laughs> yeah he's a, he'd be a great law professor oh that's true that's yeah. true can't you see him with like the tweed jacket and the <laughs> the arm the what do you call it elbow um pads <laughs> just happy to talk to anyone for mm -hmm. <laughs> about this subject remember when he came on the show everyone thought he was an immigration officer yeah. that was really funny <laughs> i don't i think he was a little offended by that well, I hope not. I mean, I, I loved what he shared today about how when he first started practicing, he was just using all these legal terms. And I mean, he's just so knowledgeable, it kind of flows out of him. And he's had to kind of talk more naturally. Well, you know, he and Tim both had, like, literally, Daniel, the guy that wrote the immigration law textbook. So um, usually there's like one or two professors around the country who've written the textbook that you use for that subject. Like, there's a guy named Lawrence Tribe, and he wrote the con the constitutional law book that we read forever. And they were both lucky to have this fellow named Stephen Legomsky, who's like an immigration virtuoso. Like he's he's a total rock star and really really smart. Um, but you know, over at WashU, they're not as practical as SLU. They they're not they're not so. I mean, they're they're a little bit more academic, and so they mm -hmm. they operate sort of at this higher level. So it and and you know and when you go to law school, just generally they teach you to use all these really precise big words. So to sort of break that habit, you really have to practice to try to you know bring it back to normal speak. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting, Jim. Um, yeah. We've got about 10 more minutes. We haven't had a good walk and talk, but I think we got one next, Jim. Oh, your favorite. <laughs> favorite. Berkeley, welcome. Oh, you're on mute, Sarah. Sorry, um, I had to step away from the car so you guys can hear me. So I, I didn't even think I would get on today, but I did. You're great. Um, hey, Jim. Hey, Daniel. I think I might be a potential new client in your office. I'm still waiting to hear back to okay. see if you have reviewed it, but I just wanted to ask, I know nothing is guaranteed when it comes to immigration, but uh, have you dealt a whole lot with uh, notice of intent to deny from asylum offices? What, you got a notice of intent to deny from where, did you say? From, from the San Francisco asylum office. Well, that's interesting. You know, you don't get noids that often on asylum cases. Um, usually they just flat out refer it over. But well, I have CPS, that's why. Yeah. yeah, but still, they would just either just sit on it. So what, well, what did they... Well, they sat on it for seven years, and then I sued them. Yeah, and so what did they say in the noid? Did, is, this did a lawsuit say... that we, is this a lawsuit we did, Berkeley? No, no, uh, no. My name is Mahmoud. Actually, I just live in oh. Berkeley. But um, oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The lawsuit was filed with another firm, and then um, I've been following your show. I just 
I couldn't catch you earlier. So I would have loved to file that lawsuit with you. But anyway, I filed okay. it with another law firm. But um, some of the reasonings in their notice of intent to deny, they're calling me a liar because of a, li a Facebook like. And I think that's like just like making me so angry. It's so stupid that you get to call somebody a liar because of a Facebook like. In the interview, the officer is asking me, do you recall liking this page? It was in 2014. I mean, how, how do you expect me to remember liking this page? You know, he's trying to trick me to saying that, oh, I don't remember liking it, then he's calling me a liar at the end. Right. Saying my whole testimony is a lie. And I don't think they really liked it that I sued them. They wanted to do background checks for another 10 years, right? And then I was like, I'm fed up with this. I did ask the officer in the interview that I will sue you guys. After I'm done with the, this, it's been too long. He's like, yeah, if you don't hear back from us, he literally told me to sue them. Him and the asylum supervisor. And I know that's out of the line. They don't usually do it. And I was like, this is ridiculous at this point that I have done three interviews. It's been seven years. What is taking so long? And then, you know, they're looking for an excuse to deny a cases. And then they're saying, oh, yeah, your testimony is not credible because you like this Facebook page. A Facebook page, the owner of the Facebook page posted stuff about when ISIS took control of Syria. What do I have to do with that? What, how is that anything that I have done? right? Like CNN, Fox News posted some of the same stuff. Does that make you and all Americans ISIS supporters? You know, do you know what I'm saying? How frustrating is that? So let me, let me see if I understand. You're saying that in total, you've had three asylum interviews? Yes. And, and wow. Okay. So when did the topic of suing them come up at the second interview? Before the third interview, I talked to the supervisor and he said the only way for your case to get moving is to buy suing them. He literally told me this. So the third interview, the third interview was before you sued them? The, no, I sued them after the third interview. So you went to the third interview before it starts. The officer says the only, the supervisor says the only way you're going to get this approved is to sue us. You go through that third interview. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then the asylum officer in the third interview said, "Save your money. Just wait another two weeks." I waited two weeks. Nothing happened. Then I started suing them. And are they saying that the like, the Facebook like, was? Yes. Are they saying that was because you? Um, because are they saying that you supported the position? Like, are they mad about the fact that you supported the position or that it was inconsistent no. with your asylum claim? No, they are mad because the Facebook page shows some like pictures of ISIS member in it, right? Mm. Like a picture. And they're saying, please explain how do you not recall liking this page? I don't recall liking it. It happened. Well, let me ask you this. Let, yeah. let me ask you this. Do you, do you have any sense as to how they found that like? It's linked to my Facebook, yeah. So it's it shows in the pages that you've liked. So your Facebook page is open to the world. It's not private or anything. It is private. They still get access to it. Well, that's what I wanted to know. Did you get a notice that Facebook had provided? No, no. Huh? no. And I've made sure to make my... I, anyway, I mean, I asked, actually, I talked to some of the people in your office and told them, I want Amani to go over the Facebook page and I want her to just see it because you can read arabic right it's my just, money my wife yeah you are money yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah uh, she can read arabic yeah she could have a sense of like this facebook page was actually just trying during the arab spring they were trying to organize people to do protests against al-assad and other regimes yeah. so if somebody who can read arabic right yeah. can tell this stupid people at uscis who could do a google translate right just do a google yeah. translate you could see the facebook page is just another Facebook page. The funny part is, Jim, there are pages that were created in the U.S., right? Like Kurdish people in Boston that have liked. They post the same stuff. And because the page is created in the U.S. in Boston, they don't care about that. But because one Facebook page is created in Syria, it's like an alarm all of a sudden. I've been here for 12 years, right? I don't even have a like, ticket. In Wait, the let, me ask this, let me ask this question, Mahmoud. So, yeah. Um, were, were there issues that they raised in the Noid that were separate from the like? Yes, else, yes. The, else, but their, their first reasoning is the Facebook page, and then they go on about other stuff. They're saying northeast part of Syria is actually safe. 
and yeah, and two months ago, you know, ISIS member tried to break up a jail in Syria, and they were. I mean, the U.S. Army is there for a reason, right? Like, mm. we have TPS for a reason. If you're saying Northeast part of Syria is safe, I don't know what safe is anymore. So, a couple of things that I want to say. Number one, yeah. for everybody listening, this is example one thousand eight hundred and seventy-two. Of, of why the Biden administration ain't much better than the Trump administration. This kind of shit, this kind of shit should have stopped a long time ago when the Biden people came in, but he brought in all these immigration hawks who just said, we're not Trump. So don't be mad at us. This is the same kind of BS that people are dealing with all over the country, the all over the world. The idea that Syria is safe uh, is insane. Sure. It's insane. Yeah. And this is the kind of stupidity that we're dealing with day in and day out. Yeah. So I don't know. Have you sent over the NOID? I sent the NOID, my asylum application, the affidavits. I sent everything to your office. I talked to, okay. I think you're a uh, super assistant. I forget people's name, but um, that's okay. Yeah. I talked to Lenith, I think that was the intake specialist, and then a lawyer that works with you directly. I don't remember her name, but she was yeah, a lady. Probably yeah. Christina. Yeah. Probably okay. Christina. Not at all, Jim. You got it, Daniel? Yeah. Okay, I'll take a look at it tomorrow. And I would love to... I, I Actually, in the interview, the last interview, I talked to the officer about the car program. He gave me a little smile, and he's <laughs> like, what do you know about the car program? And I literally said, what do you say in one of your videos? I said, it's... I didn't say it was you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, I don't care if you say it's me. I just don't I know just if they like you. This. This, is, this is intended to delay given benefits to people from certain countries right it makes no sense that i've done three interviews waited seven years and you cannot decide whether i'm eligible for asylum right well but let, let's talk about that for a minute um, yeah i know this sounds strange but sometimes three interviews is actually a good sign like to me it seems like they're trying to i know it doesn't sound like it and probably with annoyed you don't feel this way but it seems like there's something that's nagging at them that has kept them from denying the case. Like exactly. almost, almost like they know they're full of shit. Jim, this case is actually, I don't want to say strong because I'm not a lawyer, but if no. you take a look at it, the case is pretty legit. You know, they, they had so many times that my TPS was pending. They had a chance to send me to immigration court. They had all of this years to actually deny my case. They have waited all of this time. And the Facebook page is literally bugging them. I have well, to explain the, to them. Did, did the lawyer put this asylum case together? Yeah, but I've had three lawyers already. I've spent $12,000 on lawyers, and I want to get somebody who actually has experience and know what they're doing, which is why I wanted to talk to you. Did, and you, I have, think, did you have a lawyer at all three interviews? Yes, I did, yeah. Um, she was. I mean, they just sit there, you know, and... I, I hope she stopped the officer when he was asking me, do you recall? That's not a question. You should say, did you like this page? The answer is yes. But if you're telling me, do I recall liking that page in 2014? That's just stupid. Yeah. Okay. That's well, I'll take a look tomorrow. I'm going to try to get one more call in, Mike, before the day is over. Okay. So okay. let me Thanks, let you Jim. go. Yeah. But I'll yeah. take a look. All right, buddy. Okay. Thanks, man. Yeah. yeah, bye. Thank you. That was something. Wow, Jim. Yeah, for those of you who think they're not looking at your social media, example number 12. Let's do one more, Daniel. All right. Art, thank you for waiting. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate what you guys are doing. I just have a very quick couple of questions. Um, my uh, employment authorization is going to be over in July. And uh, I applied in December. And the wait time in New York is nine months. And my ID is expiring in July as well. So I know that they extended 540 days for your work authorization. And I know there is a website page. Um, the issue, like whenever I tried to get an ID here last time, I got it till the end of the work authorization. Say so, again? Oh, right. So, so when I tried, you know, when I got an ID, I got it to the same date as my work authorization. Even yeah. though when I was in the office, they were like saying, that we're actually going to give you for eight years because I, I am in a process of adjustment of status waiting for the green card. So do you have any recommendation? Because um, people who work there, they're very complicated and there's nothing to, it's very hard to prove to them something. Should I just print the page of this uh, article or like? 
from what the US, do? from the USAS website, just point out, just print out that 540 day extension. I'd be very surprised if they weren't aware of that by now. You know, it's been three weeks, so I think you'll be fine. Okay, and uh, just a second question: If you uh, make after asylum case and you adjust a status for the green card, and you know it takes three years now in some, for example, National Benefit Center. Yeah. And uh, I got the refugee travel document. Uh, I have I hundred, you know, you better know than me. And um, I'm from Ukraine. I haven't been at home like five years. I'm not not ever trying to go back to Ukraine, but I want to go back to like Amsterdam, for example, because it's visa free country yeah. for the refugee travel document to see my mom, my parents. And um, so do do I need ID when I when I like cross the line you know what i mean or do i just need the because i'm afraid like i'm going for example in june and my regular id is expired but my travel passport is still december so uh is there anything i need to know when i'm going to be crossing like do you i need into into the netherlands you mean or when you know not even when i come back yeah because into the netherlands all you need is you need your refugee travel passport that's what the consulate said okay so what's the question when you come back to the united states what will you need to enter uh, do I need the regular ID, like, uh, or would I have a problem if my ID is expiring in a month? You know what I mean? But my passport is not expiring in a month. My passport yeah. expires in like six months. No, you should be fine. But I would, like I said, I would do everything I can to get the driver's license before you leave. I think they should give oh. it to you. If you have to ask for a supervisor, ask for a supervisor. It's stupid. They shouldn't give you any trouble. This is, this is easy. Okay. And uh, I, whenever I watch the, and my lawyer, and whenever I watch the videos, majority of times there is people who say, if you have a refugee travel document and you want to go visit like the seven countries, you should be fine and you should not have any issues if you didn't violate know. anything. I don't know anything uh, about that. Okay. Got it. So you, you, you don't deal a lot with the. I don't travels. know anything about the rules in other countries. Uh, I'm talking about America. Like when you enter back America, you should not have any con problems, right? Uh, if you didn't violate anything here, like yeah, if what, you didn't come you back. Mean, but you said except for seven countries. What you or I, I missed the. No, no, sorry, sorry for the confusion. Like okay. if, when you enter America back from Europe, yeah, uh, and from the countries there are European countries, you didn't go back home where you claimed the asylum. You're just coming back. So you yeah. should not have a problems if you yeah. have this refugee travel document. So I should not be worried. You should be okay. Okay. All right. This is the only couple of questions. Sorry. Thanks, Art. Good luck, buddy. Thanks, Thank Art. You. Thank you. All right. Well, that'll do it for the Jim and Daniel show. Today was Tuesday, the 24th. I'm off to the Cardinal game. Daniel, I'll see you. Are you going to be on tomorrow or Thursday? I guess. Thursday, yeah, I think right? tomorrow is good. Tomorrow? Awesome. What, what number are we at? We're almost at 200, huh? Yeah, 200 will be next Tuesday. It will be our 200th awesome. show, so we are getting close. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Bye.